Hi guys, I wanted to talk just a little bit about how we're going to work in the lab this week and study a system, an, electronic, an electronic circuit essentially, that knows how to do calculus. You never knew that capacitors and resistors could do calculus, but guess what? They can, and we're going to see how that works. Um, I want to show you right now, uh, before we get started with the details of the theory behind the circuit and how it works, what it looks like when it's working so you'll have a sense of of what we're looking at here. So let's see, let me go ahead and uh, show you the output. So this is actually, this is the input to the circuit. We're sending in a triangle wave. Um, it's called a triangle wave. <laughs> it looks like Charlie Brown's shirt or something. I don't know what you call it. Uh, a series of saw teeth or something like that, but, uh, but it's symmetric. It goes up and down. It takes just as long to go up as it takes to go down, so it's got uh, symmetry in that way. Uh, and notice that the slope of the upgoing part matches the slope of the downgoing part, which is the same thing as saying it takes just as long to go up as it takes to go down. The slope, of course, is measured in volts per second or millivolts per millisecond or something like that. Um, right now we have, uh, actually, let's see if we can dial this a little bit. Um, it looks like it's one millisecond per division. Hang on a second. I'm going to go ahead and dial this so that it matches. Let's go ahead and make it make it match a. Uh, there we go. See if I can get that. That looks pretty good actually. And let's uh, let me adjust the trigger so that uh, we're sort of on a scope division. There you go. So now we're pretty much getting exactly uh, it takes a millisecond to go up and it takes a millisecond to go down. I'll let you guys figure out what frequency that means that must be. And I've got a knob here on my function generator that I can use to adjust the amplitude of the triangle. So I can change the slope easily. One way to change the slope is just to change the amplitude of the signal. So the slope gets bigger as the amplitude gets bigger, the slope gets smaller as the amplitude gets smaller. The other way it would be to change the frequency of the signal. I could uh, keep the amplitude the same, but change the time it takes to go up and down. Let's see, I could do that here just as an example. Um, I'll just show you real quick. There we go. Now it's got a much higher frequency, and so you can see the amplitude hasn't changed, but now the slope is much higher. But I don't want that high of an amplitude because I want it to be easier to see than that. So I'm going to go ahead and put it back where it was here. There you go, right back where it was. And um, what we're going to do is send that into a circuit that's going to take the derivative of that signal. Now, the derivative is going to be constant when the slope is constant. So what we're going to have is a function that has a constant value, and then it's going to shift to another constant value. So every time the signal changes from positive slope to negative slope, the signal is going to change to a different voltage level. And the other thing that's interesting about the circuit because of the way the op amp works is when the slope is positive the voltage is going to go down when the slope is negative the voltage is going to go up so let me go ahead and power up the amplifier here and you can just see what that looks like uh, I've got I've got on my oscilloscope this is a different oscilloscope than you guys have in the lab but yours works pretty much exactly the exactly the because we, we're not, uh, the, the in, actually the input's fairly noisy. And so when you take the derivative of a noisy input, you get a really noisy output because we're, we're calculating the little jumps and in the input will make little, bigger jumps in the output if you think about what a derivative does. But you can clearly see the pattern there. When the slope is negative, the output voltage is higher. When the slope is positive, the output voltage is lower. If I adjust the amplitude of the input, that changes the slope of the input, and therefore I get an output that um, that reflects that. Right, the the voltage goes, the amplitude of the output waveform gets larger when the slope goes up because the it's taking the derivative. I could, I guess, I could try. Well, no, I think I'll just leave it. Um, if I if I dial down, let's actually let's try it. Let's turn up the amplitude, but dial down. What have I got there? It looks like 
from the low level voltage to the high level voltage, we're going one and a half divisions. Right now, it's about 500 millivolts per division, so that's about 750 millivolts from the low voltage to the high voltage. So um, let me go in and change the frequency again. So I'm going to stop the input, and I'm going to change the frequency. Let's, uh, let's take it down this time. Okay, and then I what I want you to notice is that now the difference between the high voltage and the low voltage has gone down a lot. I haven't changed the amplitude, I changed the slope. So it really is the slope that's causing this thing to work that way. All right, I hope that makes sense. Um, we'll, I'm, now next I'm going to take a break from the oscilloscope and we're going to talk about the circuit and how it works. But I just wanted to make sure you guys, let me put it back the way it was here just to reiterate. When you guys get in the lab and you build this thing, I want you to adjust the amplitude of the sawtooth or the triangle wave and see that your um, differentiator, it's called a differentiator because it's taking a derivative, your differentiator does this, it, it, it changes its amplitude when the, when the uh, amplitude of the input waveform changes, and also um, that it's opposite the slope. So when the slope is positive, the voltage goes down. When the slope is negative, the voltage goes up. And uh, Okay, now let's talk about how this works in theory. Okay, let's talk about the theory behind these things. In class this week, I'm going to have you guys working on a problem in groups involving an op amp and doing math. Now, it's not the same circuit we're going to study in the lab. It's not the circuit I showed you just a few minutes ago. But it's uh, related in the sense that we're using an operational amplifier to to do what operational amplifiers do, but as a side effect of running the circuit, they're also going to be performing essentially a mathematical calculation. So, so let's look at this, this circuit. This is an operational amplifier. It's not the one we're using this year. We're using an LM358. This is an LM324, but it's a similar idea. Uh, it, ha it obeys basically the same rules. Remember, the two main rules of op amps are that the two inputs are virtually at the same voltage as long as the output stays in range, in, uh, in the power supply range between zero in this case and close to five volts. In the lab, we're going to be using the nano as our regulated power supply, so we'll be peaked. As you saw in the video, the peak actually is effectively about two volts, so between zero and two volts. If the output is in that range, then the inputs are equal in, in voltage. And so you'll notice this structure here. This is the same uh, structure we used last week in lab to build a times two amplifier, right? You have uh, these two resistors, and you know that the gain of this out, the gain of this amplifier, the, the ratio of the input voltage to the output voltage, is equal to the ratio of these two resistors to this one resistor. So the sum of these two. Uh, divided by this one. So, yep. Um, so, and then uh, what's, what's going on at the input here? We've got these three voltages that are connected to this one node that's connected to the plus input. So whatever the voltage is of this node, that's the input voltage. And um, the output voltage is R1 plus R2 divided by R2 times that, whatever this input voltage is. Now, what I want you, you what your guys are going to work on in class today is calculating this voltage, figuring out how this depends on these three uh, voltages. And you should be able to persuade yourselves that this formula actually describes correctly the voltage at the V plus. So I'll have you guys uh, working on that today in class. And then the question is, if, if the voltage at the plus input is the average of these three, there these three resistors are equal, so it turns out to be the average, um, what do the resistances R1 and R2 have to be in order for the output to be equal to the sum of these three voltages? What I'd love to do is to build a circuit where the output voltage is equal to the algebraic sum of the three voltages on the inputs. And so that's what you guys are going to be working on in, in, uh, in class today in your groups. The lab we're going to do 
is about this circuit. This is a, a differentiator circuit. It actually calculates an output voltage that's related to the derivative of the input voltage. And so here's my triangle wave generator, like I showed you from, uh, from the experiment that we looked at a few minutes ago. So the output, the voltage here is going to be up, going up and down. And the idea is the voltage here is supposed to be equal to the time derivative of that. The voltage at this point is just a constant. So it turns out because this is a capacitor, the average voltage of this point is just going to equal the average volt. Actually, the voltage of this point is going to be constant. It'll be equal to whatever voltage this is. And you'll notice that the output voltage is going to be this voltage plus or minus whatever the voltage drop across this resistor is. So this resistor is going to determine the voltage of the output relative to the input voltage, which we can set with this divider. So what I'm going to ask you guys to do in lab is to figure out what this divider has to be. What, what resistances do you need in this divider? So that the output voltage can be around a volt on average. So we want this to be about a volt. We know this voltage is going to be about 3.3. So um, what do we have to make this guy uh, in order to make this output voltage about a volt? I mean, it doesn't have to be exactly a volt. We, we're going to, you know, it could be 1.5 or something like that. That'd be OK. So what resistances are you going to use here to, to make that happen? And then uh, the other thing we have to figure out is what capacitance and what resistance here do you need? Um, uh, those I need you to work out by thinking about the circuit, looking at the available components you have in your kit, and figuring out what makes sense in, for this circuit. Now, what I'm going to point out is that uh, if you have a capacitor, let's just go ahead and pull up uh, Pull up Latekit here. You know that the voltage across a capacitor times the capacitance, I'll put it this way, the charge on a capacitor is equal to the capacitance times the voltage across the capacitor. So we've got this equation. And you learned this in physics, right? In physics, uh, whatever, 163, or whatever physics course you took when you learned physics. There's a the capacitance is simply the proportionality constant between the charge on a capacitor and the voltage drop across the capacitor. It's sort of like Ohm's law of capacitors, you might say. Now, if you allow the voltage to change, of course, you're going to get a change in the charge. So there's a relationship between the change in the voltage. The voltage changes a little bit. The charge changes this in a proportional amount with the same proportionality constant. Now, if you let that voltage change over some period of time, then uh, you're going to get a rate of change. We're going to do the same thing here. You're going to get a rate of change of the voltage is going to give you a rate of change of the charge. I've just divided both sides by delta T. But what's the rate of change of the charge? Well, that's nothing other than the current flow in the capacitor. So the current flowing in the capacitor is equal to the capacitance of the capacitor times the time rate of change of the voltage across the capacitor. Well, if you look at this circuit, you'll notice that the voltage at this end of the capacitor is just equal to the voltage of this divider. Remember, these two points have the same voltage as long as the output of the uh, op amp is within the range. So that means this point is fixed at, say, 1 volt. That means that whatever's happening to the triangle wave, the rate of change of the voltage on the triangle wave is equal to the rate of change of voltage on the capacitor, because the other end of the capacitor, the voltage isn't changing. So uh, that means the current through the capacitor is simply going to be the capacitance times the derivative, if we take the limit, delta t becomes small, this is the derivative of the voltage across the capacitor, and that's the current through the capacitor. So there's going to be a current flowing in the capacitor that's equal to the time rate of change of the voltage drop across the capacitor. <clears throat> that's equal to the time rate of change of the voltage of the signal generator. But where's that current going to go? 
It can't flow in here because remember the other rule about op amps is that their voltages are the same, but there's no current drawn by those inputs. So the current has to flow through this feedback resistor. And that means the voltage of the output has to go up and down in order to make that current flow in the feedback resistor equal to the current flowing through the capacitor. The output does whatever it has to maintain those two rules. The one rule is that the output voltages are equal. The other rule is there's no current flowing in the input. So if a current has to flow, it's got to flow through the feedback, the feedback resistor. The output has to go up or down in order to make that happen. If I've got a current flowing, let's say one milliamp flowing through this capacitor due to the fact that the voltage is changing, it means that this output has to be one milliamp times whatever this feedback resistor is below pin three. So pin one has to be RF times I below pin two in order for that to work. So that means the output voltage, the output voltage, we'll do it this way, RM out is equal to uh, IRF. That's the current through the capacitor times the feedback resistance. So that's going to be uh, RF here and it's going to be RF here. So uh, if you think about that, that means, oh, I'm a this is the voltage drop across RF, V of, okay, let's do it this way. The voltage drop across the feedback resistor is this. Of course, if the current is positive, that voltage drop is going to be, uh, it's going to go plus to minus. So the output will be RF times I below pin two. So to get V out, what I really want to do, let's do that V, I really mean it this time, RM out, that's going to be uh, V plus, whatever's on the V plus input, and then it's going to be minus IRF, which is going to be V plus minus this stuff. And I'm going to move the RF here. Okay. So uh, the output voltage will be V plus, whatever you set this uh, voltage divider to be, minus the voltage drop across the feedback resistor. But that's just RC, the RC constant of that combination times the derivative of the voltage. So this is the predictive equation, the generative equation that tells you what the output voltage should be. And this is what you're going to use to compare your measured output waveform to uh, this theory. Okay, you're going to use this formula to check to see if your circuit is operating correctly. And just as I showed you, you can change the amplitude of the signal, you can even change the frequency of the signal. That will affect this dvdt, and that will affect this output. And so you should be able to confirm that your circuit is operating correctly using that idea. Okay. Very good. Hey guys, so I want to show you another circuit. Uh, again, I want to show you how the circuit behaves first before we talk about the theory behind it and, and how you de develop a design for such a circuit. Um, this circuit is useful in situations where you have uh, a range of frequencies, for example, and you want to uh, amplify signals in certain frequency ranges and not amplify other frequency ranges. So you want to uh, reduce the influence of high frequency, for example, in this, in this case, high frequency signals, and you want to uh, uh, amplify low frequency signals. You can do it the other way around. You can have a circuit that uh, gets rid of low frequencies and amplifies high frequencies, or you can even have a band of frequencies that you want to amplify, and outside that band you want to uh, dial it down. Uh, we're going to do this with uh, capacitors and resistors and, a, and an op-amp. You can also do this digitally by capturing the signal and then doing math. Um, that's another approach, and uh, if you're interested in that approach, we can talk about that for maybe your final project. All right, so let's let's take a look at this one. Um, 
First of all, I have the input signal again on the oscilloscope. Let me arrange it here so it fits in the screen a little better. And uh, you can see this time it's a sinusoidal signal. Again, I can adjust the amplitude and so on. But one thing I want to do is I'd like to keep the input always above ground. So I've got an offset here that I can dial up and down. Um, and I can adjust the amplitude. What I want to do is make sure that even at its lowest point, the voltage is above ground because the amplifier, we're, we're powering the amplifier with a single power supply, which means the negative power supply connection of the amplifier is ground. And so it can't see, it can't go any below ground. It can't see any voltages below ground. It can't drive any voltages below ground. So I want to keep my inputs above ground so the amplifier um, has full access to the input okay, at all times. Um, now I'm going to power on the amplifier. I've got channel B there with nothing registering at the moment, but I'm going to go ahead and turn the power on to the amplifier, and you'll see that, boom, all of a sudden we've got uh, the output is channel B, and you'll see it's about twice the input voltage. If I take the input amplitude up, oh, you can also see the effect I was talking about. Notice the output can't go above the power supply voltage, which is, uh, let's see, we're at half a volt per division. So actually, we can't even get above, uh, it looks like we're having trouble getting above uh, two volts there. So there is de definitely, the amplifier's output is limited up below ground, and it can't even go that close to the power supply voltage, which I think is 3.3 volts. I'm using the, uh, the nano to, to give me regulated power here. Um, so, but you can see that it's it's about double as long as I stay in the range. Okay, if I if I get too high, I run into that cap at about two volts. If I get too low, I run into ground, and that's no good. So you want to keep the input uh, between zero and one volt, and then the output can go between zero and two volts freely. Okay, now I want you to notice that right now we're at 10 milliseconds per division. So if you do the math, you'll see that this is about a 100 cycle per second sinusoid coming in. I'm going to bump the frequency up. So I, the way my signal generator works, I've got to um, I've got to turn it off when I change the frequency. I'm going to go ahead and take it to 400. Okay, and you'll notice that, well, that's pretty hard to read. So I've got to go to the oscilloscope and change the time base. Let's change it to 2 milliseconds per division. And you can see it's, it's looking fairly similar, but I want you to notice a couple of things. One is the output is now shifted in phase relative to the input, and the output, its amplitude is diminished a little bit. Okay, so that, that's the filter kicking in. The filter is going to filter out frequencies above a certain level, and it's going to keep low frequencies in. Okay, so it's got a gain of two at low frequencies, but when I increase the frequency, let's bump it up again. So I'm going to go ahead and take it up to maybe 800 hertz. Start it again. There we are at 800 hertz. And uh, let's see, the input is going almost, uh, let's see, let me dial it down. Yeah, so the amplitude of the input is almost a volt. Actually, let's go ahead and make it exactly a volt. And the output, uh, it's down to, you know, not a much more than a volt. It's a little more than two divisions. You can see it's above the two division mark at the top and a little bit uh, below the two division mark at the bottom. I want to emphasize that the the gain here is an AC gain. Um, the DC gain is going to be 2 at all times. So you'll notice that the DC value of the input waveform is 1 volt. The, the DC value of the output is, is at 2 volts. So the, the, uh, the average voltage, is that gain is going to stay there. But as you increase the frequency of that input signal, the, the uh, deviation from average is going to go down. Okay. So let's, uh, let me stop it, and we'll take the frequency up another another notch here. I'm going to, um, let's go to, uh, well, I was at 1800, let's go to uh, twice that 1600. So here we are at 1600 hertz, um, and now it's way down, okay? Now you barely can see it. I'm going to turn the time base again. We're at two milliseconds per division. 
let's go ahead and bring it out to 500 microseconds, half a millisecond per division. And notice the output amplitude is actually smaller than the input amplitude. The input amplitude is going 500 millivolts above uh, half a volt and 500 millivolts below half a volt. The output is going less than 500 millivolts above 2 volts and less than 500 millivolts below uh, 2 volts on the output. So the amplitude of that output waveform is actually less than the input. And be at the beginning, it was double the input. So the gain has now gone from 2 to less than 1. So let's keep going. I'll turn it off, and we'll adjust the frequency again. I'll take it up to uh, 2200 hertz, say. Whoopsie, hang on. Well, it was 1600. 30, let's make it 3200. We'll double it. Um, okay, 3200 hertz, boom. Okay, the input uh, still has the same amplitude. It's still going from zero to one volt. Um, it's got a higher frequency because I cranked it up to 3200. Let's go ahead and change the time base again. And notice that that output now has an amplitude, golly, it's not even, uh, it's not even 200 millivolts above and below that two volt DC output value. So we're really down uh, quite a lot now. You get the idea. The point is, as the frequency of that input goes up, the amplitude of the output goes down. And uh, it's, it should be fairly predictable. And we're going to see why that happens and, and the possible uses of that as we delve into the theory a little bit. All right, very good. OK, so now that you've seen what the experiment is supposed to look like when you're running the experiment, let's look at the actual circuit. This is the circuit you guys are going to build. You'll notice that, again, we've got the same structure on the output side of the amplifier. I've got two resistors. And the only difference is now, instead of having a differentiator in front, I've got, it's, a, it's called a low-pass filter. Basically, it's an RC circuit with an input resistance and input capacitance. And um, as you can read about, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you guys read the the theory behind how that works, it's all up here in the notebook. And we'll talk about it in class to some degree as well. But basically, the idea is that at high frequencies, this capacitor uh, behaves more and more like a short circuit, bringing the voltage of this point closer and closer to ground. At low frequencies, the capacitor behaves more and more like an open circuit, like a it's no connection at all, which means the input at this point is just equal to the input to the circuit. So the, the voltage at, the, at this non-inverting input is going to, um, the DC part of the input signal is going to go straight through. It's not going to be affected by the capacitor at all because it, at, at DC, at a frequency of zero, the capacitor is an open circuit, perfect open circuit. It doesn't draw any current at all at DC. But at higher frequencies, it draws more and more current. And um, it has to do with the fact that the uh, current through a capacitor is proportional to the time rate of change of the voltage. So, um, and we'll talk about how that works in, in class some more. But the main idea is that as you dial up the frequency of the signal coming into this thing, the output, the voltage here goes down, which means the voltage at the output is going to go down. So it's not going to have as big an effect on the output. And so the goal of this experiment is to pick an R and a C here that give you a, uh, a break point so that the frequencies above about 1,000 cycles a second are smaller and smaller and smaller. The frequencies below 1,000 cycles a second are relatively unaffected, as I showed you in the, uh, in the uh, preview of the lab. And, uh, and that's basically the idea. So you're going to pick one, two, three, four component values. You want to pick R3 and R2 to give this circuit a gain of about two at low frequencies. And you want to pick R1 and C1 so that the circuit uh, starts cutting off at around 1,000 cycles a second. It won't be exact because you don't have 
uh, that many. You've only got two capacitors in your kit, for example, and you've only got a handful of different resistor values. So you don't have that many options. But we'd like to get as close to about a thousand cycles a second as we can get. All right, I hope that makes sense. Um, please don't hesitate to ask if you guys have questions.